Eh, om ni nu inte hör mig fast jag pratar i en ganska vardaglig ton. Det kan jag också säga som tips till alla er som ska prata att man behöver absolut inte skrika. Utan nu pratar jag närmast viskande jag tror att jag ändå hörs. Eh, om det är någon som inte hör mig så räck upp handen. Jag ska fortsätta att prata sen så jag fyller bussen. Räck upp handen så kommer ni få hjälp. Quite typical, I did not hear anything after trying to instruct you all. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Mrs. Ambassador, Your Excellencies, dear friends. You are more than welcome to this inauguration process of the Swedish Pavilion, Pioneer the Possible, here at the COP26 meeting. My name is Jan Larsson, I'm the CEO of Business Sweden. And I will have a very short introduction here uh, before we kick off the program. The program is essentially that I will hand over the word to, to Ambassador uh, Kumlin Granit. Uh, then we will have the Prime Minister give us a, a, a short speech. Uh, and then we will hear a few words from the, uh, from the uh, head of delegation, uh, Matthias Frumeri. Uh, after that, we will also uh, let a few other representatives from Swedish corporates uh, uh, take the stage. The CEO of Volvo Group, Martin Lundstedt, will be followed by the CTO and uh, Executive Vice President in SSAB, Martin Pei. And we will also hear the CCO and Sustainability Manager uh, of ABB, Theodor Svedjanmark. And last but not least, uh, we will uh, hear the Director General uh, of Vinova, Darja Isaksson. Uh, that is all I have to say, so let the show begin. Uh, Ambassador Michaela Kumlin Granit, please, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jan, and I'm going to be quiet because it's very inviting to speak louder. Well, thank you so much, Jan, for inviting me here, and uh, welcome to all of you here, Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, and excellencies. I must say that uh, it's a wonderful morning here in Glasgow and as a new ambassador to the UK, it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to be here at the inauguration of this pavilion at the COP26 in Glasgow, maybe one of the most important events of our time. And the presence of the Prime Minister here clearly shows the importance that we place not only on the climate issue but also on the role and the driving force of business in taking part in the green transition and also in better adapting to climate change. 
As this pavilion clearly shows, uh, the relations or the trade relations between Sweden and the UK are long-standing and deep. Um, and for those that don't know that, we've had it for centuries, formalized already in 1654 through a friendship and trade agreement. So it's really long-standing. And today, there are around 1,200 uh, Sweden-related companies that employ over 100,000 people here across the UK. Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England. And uh, there are also other many commonalities, of course, not least when it comes to the shared values. We are strong advocates of a free and open market and trade relations and of course of international cooperation. And we're also both working clearly and very hard on the green transition, not only to uh, tackle the issue of climate change, but also for job creation. I think that's something that, that we're quite good at, both of us. Um, this clearly forms a strong foundation uh, in a period that we're now entering, post-pandemic and post-Brexit and uh, which opens up for future opportunities and possibilities. Uh, Sweden and Swedish companies remain strongly committed to the UK. And as you all know, we have a strong presence in the UK in the sectors like we're seeing today, the green energy, smart city technology, uh, life sciences and electric vehicles. It's therefore a delight, it's therefore delightful to see this impressive lineup of companies which have a genuine climate and sustainability goals at their core. This brings many more opportunities for uh, Swedish innovative, innovative solutions and know-how across the UK and in line with the ambitious climate agenda of the UK government uh, where collaboration partnership is at its centre. So the sustainable solutions showcased here today uh, provide essential steps toward how we interact with environment. And all these efforts are just as important as, as everything else that we as a country do and other countries do here along and like Sweden has put forward, not least on the climate finance and adaptation. So with these short words, I would again like to welcome all of you here and uh, thank you, many of you, for your tireless efforts to improve the conditions of our planet through your innovative solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then it is my profound pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Stefan Löfven, the Prime Minister of Sweden, who will now give, um, share his thoughts on this event for a few minutes. Stefan, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and a warm welcome to the Swedish Pavilion here in Glasgow, organized by Business Sweden and partners. The theme is Pioneer the Possible. It's an open invitation to co-create and turn vision into reality. This is where we showcase Swedish technology as well as Swedish policy solutions. And I can say I'm impressed and I'm proud to see so many companies, government agencies and also NGOs represented as partners in this project. This is a space to meet and exchange experiences, a space to meet with actors from all over the world in real life and also virtually. And the world wants to see Sweden, that is for sure. There is a great curiosity surrounding this small country in the northern Europe that creates headlines on the topic of leading the way towards a sustainable future as well as pioneering the possible. This is of course a result of your efforts, of your commitments to driving and innovating climate change. The last climate COP I attended was in Paris in 2015, where the Paris Agreement was adopted after years of hard negotiations. And we have come a long way since Paris. 
back then only parts of the world and limited segments of the private sector were working consistently on going green. Today, governments, the business sector, and civil society know that those who fail to align with the goals of the Paris Agreement down to the very core of their organization will be left behind. And as you know better than most, sustainability and innovation that enable a green transition are prerequisites for remaining competitive. Becoming fossil free and climate neutral is a necessary commitment to future generations. Now, despite the positive progress we are witnessing, we are also painfully aware that so much more needs to be done. The latest IPCC report confirms this, and the effect of climate change and the resulting loss of biodiversity are felt all around the world. It is therefore crucial that we all share policy options and innovation technologies that work to support true transformation and everybody, everybody needs to get on board. In the run-up to COP21 in Paris, I took part in the launch of Fossil Free Sweden. This initiative brings together stakeholders from all parts of our society to set out roadmaps for different sectors. The initiative's objective was to determine how to achieve a fossil-free welfare state by 2045 at the latest. And that is in accordance with our climate framework. And your part in this initiative and the handshakes you have made since this the, since then are highly appreciated. And I think that this approach can also serve as an inspiration to other countries. In fact, I know it does, since I, oh, I'm often asked about the Swedish recipe for the climate transition. We have built our welfare state in large part through trade, investment, and an openness to the world. Increased trade in climate-friendly goods and services can definitely contribute to lowering emissions and building resilience globally. At the same time, it creates new green jobs and lays the foundation for our future welfare. So by matching Swedish solutions with needs in various countries and sectors, we can facilitate implementation of climate action plans all around the world. We also need to enhance our trade policy agenda by promoting sustainability action in the WTO. Sweden is committed to lowering our emissions, our emissions while at the same time enabling other countries to lower theirs through trade and cooperation. And on a recent visit to northern Sweden, I witnessed the transition to climate neutrality firsthand in battery production and fossil-free steel production. And in the rise of smart circular business models that create valuable raw materials from waste, and I also witness how this instills societies with a renewed hope for the future and willingness to live also what can be regarded as remote parts of our country. This is how we build the world's first fossil-free welfare state. And this is the Swedish message to the world. The climate transition is not only possible, it also brings great possibilities with it. And ultimately, it is a possibility to build a stronger society. And this is also the message from this pavilion from all of you leading and driving these possibilities. So from the first carbon tax 30 years ago to comprehensive, forward-looking policy instruments and cutting-edge 
technologies, Sweden wants to lead in the green transition. So please join us to pioneer the possible. Join us to pioneer the fossil free. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, if, if you allow me, I must say that for once, I can say that maybe there is one person that is even more important than the Prime Minister, and definitely more important than many of us for this very occasion. And that is naturally the chief negotiator and the head of the delegation, Matthias Frumeri. It's an honor to invite you up to the floor. Thank you, Jan, and that's quite an introduction. No pressure then from your side to deliver in the, on these two weeks that we'll be here. Prime Minister, Ambassador, friends and colleagues, such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, uh, as you know, yesterday we opened COP26, uh, we adopted the agendas, and now we're uh, engaged in across all the various agenda items to make sure that we deliver results from Glasgow during these two weeks that we'll be here. And I'd like to especially also to thank our UK hosts for bringing us here in a safe environment and making sure that we are able to bring the kind of results we need to deliver the kind of ambitious climate action that we want. And we have quite a heavy agenda uh, across delivering re results on the rule book uh, to make sure that we have res uh, rules in place for carbon markets, for reporting on our climate commitments, but also on the common timeframes for the national determined contributions that we all need to deliver in accordance with the Paris Agreement. But we also need to deliver on climate adaptation and we need to deliver on climate finance. And I'm so proud to see that the representation of countries of, and the companies here at the Business Sweden Pavilion provides the opportunity to facilitate the transition in all countries across the world, as the Prime Minister just said. So with the results that we will deliver here, you are key to making these results implemented in countries across the world. And the kind of technology, the kind of know-how and the kind of inspiration that you bring to countries across the world is going to make that happen. And that it's, that's why it fills me with such pride to be with, with you here today, to make sure that we can jointly share the, the word and share this kind of message that we are pioneering the possible. And the transition is happening right now. It's happening, as the Prime Minister said, in the north of Sweden, across Sweden. We're seeing the transition happening. And that's the kind of message that we want to bring to Glasgow that the transition can happen, it's possible, and we can do it jointly and with the kind of innov innov innovative technology and the kind of cutting edge solutions that you bring, we can jointly make this happen. So I encourage you all, companies, actors who are present here today, to make sure that everyone in, in, in Glasgow at COP26 COP will be aware and will know that Sweden will support you in pioneering the possible. The Swedish actors, the Swedish companies, Swedish politicians, Swedish civil servants, we're all here to make sure that we can jointly pioneer the possible. So when we leave Glasgow with the ambitious results we want to see, we will all be spreading around the world and everyone will know that Sweden supports you in pioneering the possible and making sure that we can keep 1.5 alive. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks for this opportunity and look forward to two productive weeks and ambitious results. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias, uh, uh, for that very interesting remark. I am now about to shift over, just as you were alluding to, from kind of the political stage to the um, private enterprise stage. And keeping with the theme here, pioneering the possible, I really think the hope and what we need to do is to stop fo focusing on what is impossible and really start looking at the possible. In the possible, there are three at least mega trends that are really playing with us right now. First, we have naturally the digitalization. And why is that important? Well, simply because connected, automated and linked up uh, uh, production means will increase efficiency. 
and if it's something we know that we need when things are to become more electrified it is more efficient pr processes more efficient uh, procedures and more efficient cooperation we also see the second mega trend which is innovation today 85 percent of the world's uh, business leaders say that innovation is extremely important for the future of their organizations and extremely important is a very strong word but 85 percent almost all only six percent of the leaders in the companies feel that their innovation programs are good enough it's a sleep bad gap of 79 percent 85 percent believe it's extremely important only six percent believe they're good enough 79 percent of the ceos of this world are sleeping poorly because they're companies are not uh, enough good at innovation. Naturally, you could believe that maybe those that should sleep bad are the 6% that believe they're good enough in, in these times. But I think that is really, really good because that forces us to, to use all the ability we have in our organizations. The third, naturally, mega trend is sustainability. And naturally, it is quite clear to me that at least in Sweden, we've reached that tipping point when we know that there is no longer any kind of way to regret. And that is seen very, very clearly within private enterprise and private companies. That when consumers, when analytics, when investors all demand fossil free and all demand sustainability, then you, then you pass that tipping point. So with efficiency, ability and urgency, uh, we are right now defining what is possible. Because who would have believed only 10 years ago that we today could produce fossil free steel who would have believed that we would have an electrified transport system with rapid uh, um, fast chargers for 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 heavy trucks uh, and motors in place technologically who would have believed that it would be possible to run mines without any uh, fossil or any 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 carbon uh, um, 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 uh, in, 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 all the, in, in all the gear that you, that you use down in the mines. Three, three companies in Sweden today symbolize very clearly, together with many others I should say, but three company, companies symbolize really this pioneer in, the, pioneer in the possible. And they're all here today. I'm really happy to see that we have both Volvo, SSAB and ABB here for this inauguration. And it's my profound pleasure again to introduce Martin Lundstedt from the Volvo Group to the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and uh, Prime Minister, Ambassador, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, great to be here also from, from the Volvo side. And I have to say to the Prime Minister and also to Matthias, obviously, it's happening in all Sweden, not only in north of Sweden. I think we are investing more heavily, both when it comes to our industrial footprints, but also when it comes to the infrastructure uh, uh, for, for logistics and transportation and and um, infrastructure in general that is very close to, to our heart in the Volvo Group, obviously, given, given our, our footprints. And, and as Prime Minister was alluding to, COP21 was, of course, a, a big thing for all of us. It became tangible what we are talking about when Paris came out, the 1.5 degrees. We have taken that to our heart in Volvo, but also in many uh, industries and horizontally as well. And now I think it's time for execution. And what is really good for us in industry is that uh, the political leadership and uh, uh, industry together have, have to do this journey, of course, with academia and with the civil society, as we've heard. But this is really the time for, for engineering, for business models, for cooperation. And what we see, obviously, when I talk about uh, uh, transport, uh, logistics, uh, and all these type of infrastructure that we are participating in, to mines and ports and quarries, etc., uh, it will increase because the mega trends are there. We have growing populations, we have urbanization, we have e-commerce that is driving a lot of transport. But we know that it must be considerably, and I say considerably more sustainable in order to cope with the planetary boundaries that we have. But transport is, has a very, very clear connection with prosperity as we knew it with a financial dimension, but it will also have a very clear connection with a social and ethical and not at least sustainable dimension. And what we see is that why does it make sense to, to work really close in Sweden, but also with our partners? I mean, Volvo Group, 400 plus billion uh, sec in, in turnover. 2% of our sales is in Sweden. And that's been all 
because we have a small market share, it's because, as the Prime Minister said, we are pretty small as a country. Uh, so, so 2% of our sales, but 25% of our colleagues, out of 100,000 colleagues, are actually in Sweden, and 60% of the research and development is taking place in Sweden. Of course, a lot of co-creation. And what we see with the digital arena, for example, uh, with CampX, that is an innovation center where we are also inviting a lot of the small companies. Uh, we see on electromobility where we are actually now sitting on a 60% uh, market share in heavy duty battery electric vehicles in the deployment in Europe. We are now running further deployment of fuel cell electric vehicles, hydrogen economy, since we need that also for balancing the grid, the, the infrastructure and the green generation of, uh, of energy, as you know. Uh, Electricity is consumed when it's produced, and it's not always a perfect match. So we also need the storage, and there we can find great solution together, by the way, in the value chain here. We love to be here and to, to uh, of course, uh, discuss with the political leadership, but also peer-to-peer, -peer, horizontal partnership in the value chains in order to make it happen. Paris, six years ago, it's time to deliver in an accelerated manner, and we will do our utmost to participate in that. Partnership is the new leadership. Let's go. Let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, let's do it together. Uh, I, I uh, do not need to say anything more than that, but just hand over to one of the people that are doing it. Martin Pei, uh, Chief Technological Officer of SSAB. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, Ambassador, dear guests. Uh, we are honored to be here, and we are ready to deliver on our responsibility to decarbonize our steel production. We are here at COP26 to show that the transition is taking place now. We hope this can contribute and support the decision makers to achieve results. It is possible and it is necessary to transform the steel industry. The steel industry stands for 7% of global CO2 emissions. This cannot go on. We need to change. We are developing a new breakthrough technology that will allow us to get rid of CO2 emissions in steel production. We have proven the technology in pilot scale and we have already delivered the first free steel to Volvo Group. This was possible thanks to cooperation with our partners LKB and Vattenfall in the hybrid initiative. It is clear that we need to work together to solve our common challenges. SSAB will move away from coal and fossil fuels and instead use fossil free electricity, hydrogen and biocarbon. We will create a complete fossil free value chain and work together with our customers. But to make the change happen, we need bold decisions here at COP26. SSAB believes it must cost more to emit. The world needs strong carbon pricing mechanisms that make the case for transition. We need a policy framework that creates a global level playing field and supports companies that are developing breakthrough technologies and show the way. So once again, on behalf of SSAB, I would like to thank the Swedish government, Business Sweden, and all colleagues for making this joint effort possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. 
Uh, I am really glad something has happened for sure when companies are standing up on stage asking politicians that it has to cost more to emit. That did not happen 20 years ago, I can tell you, when I was in the Prime, in, in, in the prime Minister's office. So I envy you, uh, Prime Minister, and, and all the collaborators of the Prime Minister for, for those kind of messages. Now I hand over the word to uh, Mr. Theodor Svedjanmark, who is the Chief Communication Officer and Sustainability Officer of ABB. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, good morning everyone, uh, Prime Minister, Your Excellency, Mrs. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here with all of you today. And it's difficult to follow sometimes Martin's excellent speeches, but I will do my very best. Um, as a Swede, uh, representing a global company and alluding to both what the Prime Minister Martin said here, we're also a very, very global company. We're operating in more than 100 countries around the world. We have a very strong heritage in Sweden, very strong roots to technology development here. It's very proud that, um, that we have such a strong presence here at COP26 from the Swedish dimension. And like all of you, we from ABB are here because we think we as a business can really help make a difference and drive positive impact in line with sustainability targets and really make an important contribution to climate action. And I mention it as a global technology company, we are active all around the world where we help our customers, but also our suppliers, communities to, uh, to drive sustainability. And then we are active in transport, uh, buildings and industry. And these are sectors which represent approximately three quarters of the global energy consumption. So we believe we have a huge um, uh, task in front of us to work with everyone in our value chain to again drive this, uh, this positive momentum. And we really create value but for ourselves, for our shareholders, again, for society, for our customers, both SSAB and, and Volvo here are important customers of us, by helping them to become more efficient and productive, circular. And they buy our products and technology and solutions because it helps them reduce their emissions uh, and get more out of their assets, i.e. to become more circular or more productive. And by 2030, we at ABB aim to be not only carbon neutral in our own operations and work very closely with our suppliers to help reduce their emissions, we have also set an explicit target of wanting to help our customers reduce their annual CO2 emissions by at least 100 megatons annually in 2030. And to put this in perspective, this is more than 150 times the impact that ABB company globally active in 100 companies become, uh, becoming carbon neutral ourselves. And for, for us, the answer to this is twofold. It's technology and people, and therefore we need to invest in technology. Again, there was a lot of talk here about technology. Of course, we follow the Green Steel. We're also actively involved in different ways or form in, in many of these projects, and of course, together with Volvo as well, supporting e-mobility transition, etc. But we not only need to invest in innovation, but also in implementation to really make sure that these energy efficient technologies make their way into society and into industry all around the world to have the maximum effect that they need to. So we have invest approximately 5% of our global turnover in R&D. Uh, and today, majority of this, we like to look at it as uh, driving innovation, majority in technologies which help drive sustainable development not only within ABB but in our entire value chain. So we're here at COP26 uh, to try to impress upon policymakers from all over the world that investment in technology and its deployment is the best source and return on capital that we can do today, both for society but also for the environment and the economy. And to give you one example that we like to talk about because it's relatively concrete, if you would simply retrofit every electric motor, and about 300 million of them in the world, with the most energy efficient ones that are available today and couple them with a variable speed drive, you can reduce energy uh, consumption used by 50% oh, of the world's energy consumption by more than 25%. And if you add a digital sensor to these motors, you can even further optimize perform uh, performance. And if you could reduce 25% or 45% of the world's energy consumption, you can see the, the huge potential that you have available with already existing technology today. Some of it which also stems out of our R&D people and, and people here in Sweden. Another important driver for sustainability is e-mobility, was mentioned I think by everyone here. Um, and we are very proud, we just launched what we call the world's fastest electric 
car charger, I shouldn't say vehicle, because we have even more powerful ones for buses and trucks, uh, but for normal cars, um, which is capable of full, uh, fully charging an electric car in less than 15 minutes, or adding 100 kilometers of range in less than three minutes. So at least from our perspective, as the global leader in, in electrical vehicle car charging, uh, we think we have reached now from a techni technological perspective, the tipping point where it will be as easy and comfortable to drive an electric car as to drive a normal combustion engine car. So there are no more excuses, at least from that perspective. And here in Glasgow and here at the Swedish Pavilion, um, we have representatives from all the key stakeholder groups. Of course, honored to have the Prime Minister here representing the government, but also Martin and Martin representing industry and, and many others. Uh, because the solution is really that we all work together between government, business, but also academia and other parts of civil society. Without collaboration, there will be no positive momentum in this area. So we look forward, together with my team here, some of you know some of them, uh, to have some fruitful discussions over the next couple of weeks with people from all over the world uh, to help really to take this step forward. And we solely believe that we cannot uh, solve climate change here at COP, but we certainly can make very, very decisive steps forward. So all the best to you, a lot of weight on your shoulders. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Theodore, uh, for those words. Innovation and implementation, and on top of that, collaboration. It is like someone have thought through this program very clearly, because there can be no better words in handing the word over to uh, Daria Isaksson, the general, Director General for Vinova. The floor is yours. Mr. Prime Minister, Madam Ambassador, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We're facing hard deadlines now, deadlines that are set by the planet. It doesn't care about our willingness to invest or our ability to collaborate. We must adapt, transform every value chain, every city, every consumption pattern to lie safely within planetary borders. We need to do it in a socially sustainable way and quickly. Success means that our children already in school we'll get to live in a society that's better than the one we're leaving behind. The alternative is abysmal. It's an enormous task, but it can be done. Using science, innovation, and markets directed towards solving these societal challenges, we can create healthier, better societies for all. Now is there for the time for ambitious missions, ambitious policy, and co-creation between academia, industry, public sector, entrepreneurs, and civil society. Co-creating the new knowledge, the radically improved technology, the new business models, and the citizen engagement that can help deliver all of this. And as a response to the global pandemic, we're now seeing investments previously unheard of all over the world. Therefore, now is also the time to invest wisely. Sweden is a small country with only 10 million inhabitants. We may seem like just a city from a global perspective, but we are global leaders in innovation. And there's really no secret as to why, just a long-term strong commitment to keep innovating and to invest wisely. That's reflected in how we, for instance, for a long time, have invested 3.4% of our GDP into research and innovation, where one third comes from the government and two thirds comes from industry. It's also reflected how we, for a long time, have made serious efforts to make sure that we draw on all of the best talent in our country, regardless of gender or background. And it's also reflected on how we, together, have nurtured a culture of collaboration. We dare to take risks together, to experiment, and continuously explore how we can create value for others through the open flow of people, goods, and ideas, but also through strong international partnerships. Today, Swedish industries are leading the way in this transformation, building on strengths varying from new materials, electrification, uh, connectivity, automation, advanced manufacturing, and a world-class startup ecosystem. What we're now seeing are new value chains emerging, delivering on the promise of fossil-free steel, of fossil-free mobility, on new circular flows of material that open up opportunities for many. Transforming into a sustainable society represents the biggest opportunity for value creation since the first industrial revolution. 
Investing wisely, therefore, is to invest in this future, and we do. And yet, that's not what's most inspiring of it all. You know, I grew up in northern Sweden, places filled with northern lights, lots of space. Well, it's also part of the world that may seem far away from the center of things to many. I wish you could all go there now. I wish you could all feel it. What transformation means when it has an impact on society. How it's already changing local communities. How people think about themselves. How they act. Places recently all but forgotten are now at center stage, bringing the future back. So this is what innovation is all about. This is what COP26 is all about. It's making sure that we are ambitious, that we invest wisely, and that we take this unique opportunity of our time to bring back a better future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria. With those words, I invite um, Prime Minister Stefan Löfven up on stage again for the formal inauguration. So it is with high expectations, it is with pride that I now formally declare the Swedish pavilion uh, to pioneer the possible open. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, within a few minutes, there will be a press conference. So, all of you, if you have.
Ja, hej då och eh, välkomna hit. Eh, jag tror att alla här med väldigt stora förväntningar det, det är faktiskt koka ut av, ut av aktiviteter här och eh, jag hoppas verkligen att det ska bli en, ett lyckad eh, kopp. Eh, jag tyckte att invigningen här av den svenska paljongen eh, sätter ljuset på något som är väldigt viktigt och som jag ska återkomma till. Det är nämligen att se alla möjligheterna med den här klimatomställningen. Så nu inleds förhandlingarna här i Glasgow. Det känns som sagt att det är mycket som står på spel. Det här är första gången som parterna som träffade Parisavtalet träffas sedan förhandlingarna i Madrid som ju avslutades då i december 2019. Och som ni kommer ihåg då så blev det på övertid och utan att lösa några av de stora frågorna som, som stod på agendan. Det är helt uppenbart att det kommer att vara hårda förhandlingar också här ända in i kaklet. Jag vill nämna tre punkter som det är viktigt att vi kommer fram på. Det första är naturligtvis att fler behöver göra mer för att vi ska säkerställa att målet om 1,5 grad kan, kan nås. Att max 1,5 grads temperaturökning. Och där är ju vetenskapet mycket, mycket tydlig. Så det är helt enkelt så att vi måste snabba upp genomförandet av Parisavtalet. Det andra är att för att göra det så måste vi komma överens om Parisavtalets regelbok. Det vill säga hur alla parter på ett enhetligt sätt både mäter och rapporterar utsläpp. Det är naturligtvis helt avgörande för att kunna nå 1,5 graders målet. Och från Sverige och EU vill vi då se betydligt mer enhetliga regler om det här som inte urholkar ambitionerna. Det tredje är att vi måste också stödja utvecklingsländerna i deras klimatomställning. Det är ju viktigt i sak men det är också väldigt viktigt för förhandlingsläget. Och vi, de utvecklade länderna, har ju då lovat och åtagit oss att gemensamt bidra med 100 miljarder US dollar i klimatfinansiering årligen och då från 2020. Det har vi inte lyckats med hittills och det kommer att försvåra förhandlingarna. Från svensk sida har vi sedan tidigare och bedömt bidra med vår del. Och nu har vi dessutom annonserat att vi kommer att fördubbla klimatbeståndet till 2025. Och att hälften av vår klimatfinansiering då ska också gå till klimatanpassning. Samtidigt görs ju bedömningen nu att det här 100 miljarders målet inte kommer att nås förrän 2023. Jag tycker att det är en skam. Jag tycker att det är en självklarhet att alla ska göra sin del och Sverige tar som ett av alldeles för få länder sitt ansvar. Även om jag önskar att det här skulle gå mycket, mycket snabbare så konstaterar jag ändå att det finns också signaler om att det går i en positiv riktning. Det rör på sig helt enkelt. Det är fler och fler som pratar nu om 1,5 graders målet som uppnår det. Det är färre och färre som vill falla tillbaka till 2 graders målet. Och G20-länderna enades igår om att höja ambitionerna om att förbinda sig, att förhålla sig till, att hålla sig till just 1,5 grader. Det var många som såg det som en oväntad utveckling. Jag menar att det visar att det går att komma framåt om bara den politiska viljan fram finns. Och om den politiska viljan också finns här under förhandlingarna i Glasgow så går det att åstadkomma bra resultat. Jag är övertygad om att det går att komma överens. Och det är helt enkelt för att vi måste. Vi har inget alternativ. Vi måste komma överens och då går det också att hitta lösningar på det som tidigare har varit låsta positioner. Senare idag så håller jag mitt inledningsanförande och då kommer jag ta upp naturligtvis betydelsen av att vi håller oss till 1,5 graders målet och att vi alla behöver göra mer för att åstadkomma det. Men jag kommer också att använda Sverige som ett bevis för att Klimatomställningen faktiskt inte bara är möjlig utan att den också innebär stora möjligheter att bygga starkare och bättre samhällen. Det som händer just nu i Sverige, nyindustrialiseringen som driver fram ny teknik som tar oss mot netto nollutsläpp och samtidigt skapar nya gröna jobb. Och det är det som lägger grunden för framtidens välfärd. Det är en berättelse som behöver bli känd här. Så nu mycket handlar om svårigheter i, i förhandlingar och låsta positioner. Då är jag övertygad om att vi måste också lyfta blicken och visa på det som är de reella möjligheterna, vad det här faktiskt handlar om. 
nämligen vår gemensamma framtid på den här planeten. Och vi har på riktigt en unik möjlighet att omvandla klimatkrisen till smartare och bättre samhällen om vi gör det här rätt. Intresset för Sverige är stort. Det har konstaterat jag det har konstaterat länge i samtal med andra ledare. Men inte minst utifrån de inbjudningar som jag har fått under det här COP-mötet. Bland annat så kommer jag målen att det tar i samtal om koldioxidbeskattning under ledning av Kanadas premiärminister Justin Trudeau. Joe Biden och Ursula von der Leyen har bjudit in till möte om metangasutsläpp. Afrikanska unionens ledare till lika demokratiska republiken, Kongos president eh, Tisekedi har bjudit in till samtal om klimatadaption. Och jag kommer också att diskutera finanssektorns roll i klimatfrågan med mina nordiska kollegor. Så Sverige är en stark röst här och det tänker jag självklart göra det mesta utav. Och det vet jag att också Per Bolön, Per Olsson Frid och Thomas Eneroth kommer att göra. Och hela den svenska förhandlingsdelegationen kommer att göra under de här förhandlingarnas vecka. Tack! Tack statsminister Stefan Isakersson, Sveriges Radio. Du sa ju själv att det är mycket som står på spel här nu. Vi hörde Storbritanniens Boris Johnson igår prata om att om Glasgow inte lyckas så är Parisavtalet i princip inte värt pappret det är skrivet på. Dels undrar jag om du håller med om den bilden, att det här är så avgörande. Men sen så pratade du också om Sverige som ett positivt exempel i klimatomställningen och att fler länder behöver göra mer. Då undrar jag hur du ser på chanserna att få med vissa av de stora aktörer som behöver vara med på det här tåget så att säga, som till exempel mm. Kina. Först om, om Boris Johnsons uttalande och så, man, man kan säkert säga det på, på olika sätt och eh, däremot har också John Kerry sagt att om vi inte klarar det här nu då, då det här är sista chans att klara en och halvgradersmålet. Gör vi inte det, klarar vi inte det här, får ihop det här nu då, då eh, är det stor risk att vi inte klarar en och halvgradersmålet och det är just därför alla måste se det, hur mycket som de facto står på spel. Jag lyssnade i morse på eh, BBC TV och, och hör ju om, om några stormar man upplever här och nu i UK och vi har det i Sverige, vi har det över hela världen. Det brinner, det är torka, det är översvämningar, det är stormar eh, och om inte vi kan förstå nu vad som behöver göras då är, då är det ett, ett rejält problem, det vill jag säga. Eh, så det, så när det gäller de stora spelarna så har vi fått också ny eh, NDC från, från Kina. Jag hoppas verkligen att Indien levererar ett. Det behövs för vi måste ha de stora spelarna med oss. Men det är också så då att eh, för att det här ska gå riktigt bra så menar jag att det är viktigt att vi klarar den här 100 miljarders målet. Att vi kan faktiskt, den rikare delen kan bidra med de här 100 miljarderna från och med 2020. Vi har inte lyckats ännu, vi måste göra det. Därför att det kommer att spela roll här. Och jag tog upp det redan i samband med unga här i New York för några veckor sedan. Att egentligen så är det bara för oss att göra matten. Vem ska bidra med vad? Vi är faktiskt redan där i Sverige. Och vi har ändå sagt att nu ska vi dessutom fördubbla. Så här måste vi måste göra mer. Men det, det, det bekräftar också Boris Johnson i morse när jag träffade honom i samband med doorsteppen. Här, att att eh, Sverige är en föregångare. <hör> Ja, hej Anna-Maja Persson, SVT. Eh, jo, du sa att du skulle träffa Joe Biden och eh, von der Leyen. Eh, vad exakt kommer du att framföra där och vad är målet med det mötet? Målet med det mötet det är, det är metangasutsläppen som är del i, i problematiken. Det är ju Sverige egentligen inte har. Vi har inget, inget stort problem där. Men det, där finns en gemensam, ett gemensamt åtagande om minst med 30 procent och det har Sverige, vi ställer upp på det helt enkelt och då har vi blivit inbjudna för det och det är ingen, inget tal direkt där så men jag får ju möjlighet att, att träffa de två naturligtvis och, och det, det är samma budskap, vi måste, vi måste se till att göra det här tillsammans och eh, USA har ju också höjt sina ambitioner, nu gäller det att se till att, att vi, att, jag tror att USA och EU kommer att vara två väldigt viktiga spelare så det, det är möjlighet att, att prata med de båda. Och vad ser du som den enskilt viktigaste punkten, enskilt viktigaste målet med hela COP26? 
Alltså det övergripande är ju så att när vi åker härifrån kan vi säga att vi klarar fortfarande en och en halv graders målet. Och det bygger i sin tur på att det här regelverket från Parisavtalet att det faktiskt kommer på plats på riktigt. För att eh, om inte vi kan mäta det här gemensamt och rapportera på, på ett gemensamt sätt och, och ett, eh, eh, som, som alla ser det transparent och så, då kommer vi att ha svårt att göra det. Och det andra det är klimatfinansiering. Jag tycker återigen att det, är en, att det är en skam att vi inte har kommit till 100 miljarder. Det borde vi vara, har redan varit. Men låt oss se till att göra det nu då. Mm. Hörs, hörs jag. Hörs jag. Ja. Eh, jo, mycket av de besked som har kommit inför COP handlar ju om att man bekräftar sånt som man redan har kommit överens om. Va, vad tycker du om det? Man, det krävs ju att man höjer ambitionerna. Ja, det, det krävs ju mer. Och det är därför som vi, men vi ser ju ändå att de nya nationally determined uh, commitments, uh, contributions som vi gjorde NDCs här, att när man tittar bara på de nya så ser man att då går det, då går det bättre. Tittar man på alla NDC som har lämnats hittills så är det långt ifrån tillräckligt bra och det är inte bra nya heller men vi ser att med de nya så blir det bättre, då anstränger sig länderna mer. Och det är därför som vi kan inte bara hålla oss till det som har, har lovats redan utan vi måste fortsätta och göra, det är därför rapporteringen är så viktig, att vi gör den enhetligt, att vi gör den regelbundet. Vi står ju för att det är fem år det borde vara, eh, så att vi, vi kan följa det noggrant. Och, och, och hela Parisavtalet bygger på det, att man kommer med förbättrade åtaganden hela tiden. Se till att bryta ner den där kurvan på minskade utsläpp, så, så det är det viktigaste vi kan åstadkomma. Eh. Vad kan ni åstadkomma under de här två dagarna då? Kan, eh, ni ska inte fatta några beslut, ni ska inte ha någon deklaration. Vad, eh, vad kan ni göra för att pressa på? Men det är ändå viktigt att världens ledare samlas. För att vi, vi från vår horisont ska säga att vi, vi måste stå kvar vid en och en halv grad. Det är det som gäller. Och sen är det naturligtvis upp till oss i våra respektive delegationer och olika samverkan. Se till att det då fullföljs med... Åtagande. Det är därför vi måste följa upp. Hur kommer rapporteringen att ske nu hädan efter? Kommer vi få en mer enlighet rapportering? Hur kommer klimatfinansieringen? Hur, när, hur ska vi se till nu att vi faktiskt får till de här hundra miljarderna? Så det, det har ändå betydelse, även om inte vi ska sitta och formellt fatta beslut, så har det betydelse att världens ledare här, nästan alla i alla fall. Jag tror att eh, flera av de som inte kommer hit fysiskt kommer ändå att delta virtuellt också. Så, jo, jag, jag påstår att det har betydelse. Hur går G20-ländernas löfte om en och en halv grad ihop med att G20 inte ens kan enas om att fasa ut kolkraften? Ja, kolen är ju och fossila, är, där är det problem och där är vi tydliga. Det, det finns ingen återvändo här. En del kan man säkert ordna med så kallad capture, men, men kol och, och det fossila måste bort. Det, det, det bara är så, så där, där kommer vi att behöva göra mer. Och det är därför det är så viktigt att vi visar också här att till exempel så att stålindustrin kan vi ställa om så att det inte längre använder kol. Den står att produceras på samma sätt i 1000 år. Nu gör vi om det. Så att vi måste fortsätta lägga på det. Det håller inte att fortsätta tänka kol utan man måste tänka bort kol och fossilt. Vad har du för råd till din efterträdare på klimatområdet? Ja, det är bara att fortsätta. Vi är ju ett land som är, är fast beslutsamma att vara ledare i detta. Och där jag menar att vi har kommit till en, till en, en vändpunkt, eller kan jag säga en, en punkt ska jag säga, där vi ser mer och mer vad, det, vad möjligheter det erbjuder med ny industrialisering till exempel. Så det är bara att hålla i den där, hålla i samarbetet med näringslivet, med civilsamhället, hålla i målsättningar och sen till att bryta ner kurvan så att vi faktiskt når de mål vi har sagt. Hej, eh, Ingvar Ensson från We Don't Have Time här. Vi har en fråga kring fossila subventioner. Enligt IMF så har det ökat efter corona till 5,9 trillion US dollar. 6 procent av global BNP. Sveriges fossila subventioner går också upp. Hur, kommer Sver Hur ser Sverige på fossila subventioner? Är inte det något som motverkar klimatomställningen att göra det fossila billigare än vad det borde vara? Jo, vi måste bort från det. Vi ska komma ihåg också att 2020 så hade vi en dramatisk minskning i produktionen. Den går upp igen. Då, så länge man inte gjort någonting under den tiden, då har vi haft fokus på en pandemi. Eh, att faktiskt hantera en pandemi. Men det är klart att på, så snabbt som möjligt komma från subventionerna, det, det är det, det som gäller, ja.